Chapter 136, Seventh Year, Mind Games Everyone was thrilled to see Marlene, of course. Sirius ushered her through the fat lady's portrait as fast as he could and practically trumpeted her arrival to the whole common room, as though he'd conjured her from thin air. Lily and James rushed over, hugging her and taking her bag and cloak and leading her to the couch by the fireplace, where Mary hugged her so fiercely Marlene almost squeaked. "'We've missed you!' Mary exclaimed, finally letting her friend go. "'I can see that,' Mary gasped, pink-cheeked. "'Have you all been that bored without me?' Remus hung back a little. He and Marlene didn't hug much anyway, so he didn't think it would be noticed. He watched her warily and chose to sit in the armchair furthest away from her, trying not to draw attention to himself. Christopher had slipped away too, at some point, maybe up to his dorm room. In the back of his mind, Remus hoped Chris wasn't angry with him, but he filed that away for another time. He had too much to worry about with Marlene's return. "'How's Danny?' Mary was asking now, lowering her voice. "'He's recovering,' Marlene nodded, her eyes serious. "'He's at home now. Mum's driving him crazy as usual. "'He won't... he won't be going back to the cannons.' She swallowed and looked down at her hands. "'It's a bloody disgrace.' James banged his fist on the arm of the couch. If I was their manager, I'd... He's too badly injured anyway. Marlene shook her head, quickly wiping under her eyes. He'd have been off for the rest of the season either way. It'll be months before he's back on a broom. So, just as well. Still bollocks, James muttered. Yeah, well... Marlene stood up stonily. Can't hardly blame him. I know I would have, anyway. Not worth thinking about. Remus felt sick with tension. Everyone else sitting in the group knew what he was. Everyone except Marlene. The guilt he'd been successfully avoiding for a week came crashing back over him like a cold shower. It had been his responsibility to warn everyone of the attack. He'd told Dumbledore, but it hadn't been enough. He'd failed. And now the evidence of his failure was sitting right in front of him, her face thin and her eyes dark with worry. Marlene cleared her throat and flashed them all with a brave smile. I'm going to talk to Madame Pomfrey as soon as I can, see if she recommends anything. The healers at St. Mungo's were useless, more concerned with keeping him quarantined than actually helping him. Hardly anyone can answer the questions I had about transformations or aftercare or pain relief. It was like they'd rather I just stopped talking about him, like they wanted to pretend he wasn't there. Her voice was getting higher and thinner as she said this, tears threatening to choke her. She cleared her throat again. I mean, I know what he is, don't get me wrong. I know what he's going to become. But he's my brother for fuck's sake. Of course he is, Mary said, squeezing Marlene's hand. She gave Remus a look and he looked at her feet. No, no way, absolutely not. No one else was speaking, but they all had the same look on their faces. Are they thinking about me? Remus wondered queasily. Do they blame me, or are they wondering what I'm capable of? Anyway, Marlene shook her head again. What's been going on here? Is that your cat, Lily? Valentine's Day present, Lily smiled, stroking the purring bundle in her lap. His name's Hieronymus. Catchy. Marlene sniffed, smiling. Nice one, Potter, you big softy. You're still on my team, right? James asked, leaning forward. My star beater? Obviously, she rolled her eyes. I'm assuming the training times haven't changed. First thing tomorrow morning, James grinned. And we're planning this huge... Peter started eagerly, but was cut off. Oi, McKinnon! They all turned round to see Yasmin standing behind the couch, hands on her hips and grinning widely. She'd obviously been getting ready for bed. Her hair was piled messily up on her head, and she was wearing in her oversized Hollyhead Harpy shirt and a baggy pair of men's wincy at pyjama bottoms. All right, Patel, Marlene answered. Remus couldn't see her face, but he knew she was smiling. She twisted round on the couch and got up on her knees, and the girls hugged tightly. You could do that, Remus realised, if you were girls. No one thought it was weird. He wondered if Sirius was thinking the same thing. He hoped not. That pretty much put an end to any more werewolf talk, which was a relief. Remus hoped he could avoid it later. 
when it was just him and Sirius. He was sure to want to know how Remus felt and what his thoughts were. And while, yes, okay, Remus did understand that communication was important and blah, 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 did that mean they had to discuss every painful thing in minute detail? For God's sake, he was already getting agitated about it and it hadn't even happened. He cracked his neck, then his shoulders, willing himself to loosen up. He was still a bit wound up from that kiss out in the corridor, he realised. He wasn't sure whether or not Sirius had meant it that way, or if it was just a show for Christopher, but it had stirred something in Remus, and now it felt like unfinished business. He shifted a bit in his seat and tried to ignore that too. Mary had tactfully moved to the other end of the couch, and was now casually filing her nails and chatting to Lily, who was teasing Hieronymus with a quill. Yaz climbed over the back of the sofa to take her place, and she and Marlene had their heads together, speaking very quickly and quietly. Remus caught the muggy scent of the Muffliato spell, which was odder from the outside than the inside, as if their very words were blurred out somehow. They were sitting so close to each other that their thighs touched, Yaz's arm slung round the back of the couch just behind Marlene's head, in a way that would have raised eyebrows, even if only one of them was a boy. James and Sirius were in a deep conversation about the upcoming Quidditch match against Ravenclaw. Peter was interjecting every now and then with his own tactical insights. Remus pulled his book out and tried to read. It was no good. He couldn't concentrate with so many people chatting. The last postcard from Grant was tucked into the dust jacket of Maurice and he read it again. This time the photo on the front was of three bikini-clad girls frolicking in the sea. Even Sirius had found that one funny. There wasn't much on the back. Grant was a man of few words when it came to written correspondence. Working hard, having fun, hope you're well, love. That word again. Obviously Grant could say it, or write it. He couldn't spell Remus's surname the same way twice, but love was no big deal. Only half an hour ago, Remus had been almost completely free from worry, cocooned by his friends and Sirius and the idiotic notion that everything would be okay if they could just come up with a really good prank. But the shade had fallen now, and no matter where he looked, all Remus could see was trouble and his own failings. Frustrated, he slammed his book closed on the postcard a little too hard. Everyone looked up. All right there, Mooney, Lily asked gently. Fine, sorry, Remus nodded. He reached into his pockets for a cigarette, pulling out his matchbox quickly. Not in the common room, please. Lily switched to head girl mode, quick as a flash. Right, right, sorry. He clambered clumsily to his feet, fag pursed between his lips. I'll go upstairs. We're going to bed too, Marlene said, then blushed and stammered quickly. I mean upstairs, to sleep. Um, you know, if we've got an early practice. Yaz was barely able to keep a straight face as she waved goodbye to them all before hurrying up the stairs after a girlfriend. Mary and Remus shared a knowing look, but Lily and James still seemed blissfully ignorant. Night. Remus nodded to everyone, heaving his bag onto his shoulder and heading up the opposite flight of stairs to the boys' dormitories. It was a mistake. Alone, he had nothing to distract him from his own judgments, and they were harsh. Quite right, too, in Remus's opinion. If the McKinnon family could not forget the repercussions of his failure to act, then why should he have any respite? And those were just the people he knew he'd let down. There were families up and down the country now, facing a full moon for the first time. It was a good thing his father was dead and his mother had washed her hands of him. At least he couldn't cause them any more pain. He sat on the window ledge, letting the cold air wash over him, smoking and thinking and scolding himself until he thought he may as well just fling himself out of it. But that was just a passing fancy. Remus was too much of a coward to do what ought to be done. This much he knew. Still, he felt a strong urge to do something. Something drastic, something violent. The wolf inside would have liked a good long run, but it would be past curfew soon. There was a bit of dope in his sock drawer, but that would only make him more gloomy. Someone was hiding a bottle of fire whiskey, he could smell it, but that was probably in preparation for his own upcoming birthday, and he couldn't spoil that for his friends. Maybe put on a record and flail around a little bit, but he'd never been much for dancing and his hip was bothering him. Sirius's footfall on the stairs disrupted his thoughts. Remus licked his lips, remembering that kiss from earlier. Ah, there was always that, the ultimate distraction. 
Decision made, he stubbed out the cigarette and got up, striding purposefully across the room. He reached the door just as Sirius pushed it open. Best not to even give him a chance. Watch him, Mooney, just came to see if you... He shut him up with a fierce kiss, crushing their lips together, pulling him at the hips so they were pressed hard against each other. Uh, oh, okay, Sirius gasped when he finally wrenched himself free. He kicked the door shut behind himself as Remus dragged him to the bed. It was good. It was really, really good. Remus's frustrated urgency was met with answering eagerness from Sirius, and they tore against each other, out of sync in the best possible way. Losing yourself in drink or drugs was nothing compared to losing yourself in Sirius Black. They'd been at this long enough to know the edges of each other's limits and just how far they could push them. Fuck. Sirius groaned when it was all over and the windows were steamy and the waxing moon had risen outside. Remus reached for his fags once more, still buzzing, his hot skim humming. Fuck, Sirius said again on his back, staring up. Beautiful mess. What brought that on? Just you, Remus replied, exhaling smoke. Just wanted it. Not complaining? Remus settled back, smoking quietly. This was good. This was better, anyway, than anything else he could be doing. He was still restless, though. A bit more tired, but fidgety and unsettled. He could go again. He could go all night if it would shut his brain up. That made him glance at the door. They hadn't shut the curtains, and by some miracle had gotten away with it. Where are the others? Hmm? Sirius's eyes had drifted shut, but he stirred awake valiantly. Uh, Pete's three rounds into a chess game with a second year, who's obviously some sort of evil mastermind. Mary went to bed, and Prongs and the Misses have gone to the prefect's bathrooms. They thought they were being subtle. He chuckled lightly under his breath. I'm going to brush my teeth, Remus said, getting up. In the bathroom, everything came flooding back, and he couldn't meet his own eyes in the mirror. When he came back out, Sirius had woken up a bit and was sitting up in bed. He smiled at Remus. I just wanted to check you were okay about Marlene and everything. Fine, Remus nodded casually, climbing back in, drawing the curtains closed as he did so. It's good to have her back. Hmm, I hope you're not worried about... Do we have to talk about that? Remus crawled toward him, straddling his lap. He began kissing Sirius's neck, rocking into him slowly. Blimey again? Sirius sounded surprised, but not unhappy about it. Hmm. Remus replied, taking his wrists and holding them tight. Such lovely, lovely wrists. Oh, okay, but if you're worried, shut up, Black. Remus growled, pulling back and meeting his eye. Sirius did, biting his lip. Remus smiled. Much better. No talking tonight. It was a cruel trick, really, exploiting Sirius's peculiar proclivity for following direct instructions, but it worked and Remus got his peace, at least that night. The next day was tougher, but lessons in library time became a comfortable barrier between them once again, not to mention the general rabble of friends who accompanied them pretty much everywhere. A wiser, braver man might have used the time to look into himself, to address the feelings of guilt and shame and self-disgust, and maybe even make some changes for the better. Remus preferred pretending everything was fine. And for a little while, anyway, it seemed that Sirius was going to let him. They were still together almost all of the time, and it wasn't as if they were arguing. If Sirius wondered why Remus's libido rocketed any time they started to have a private conversation, he didn't say anything. In the end, he took a different tact. The weekend before the upcoming full moon, they were walking back up to the school from Hogsmeade, and Remus had had to slow down because of his stupid hip yet again. Sirius and James were chatting ahead, but Christopher hung back to keep Remus company. They'd been to the three broomsticks, but the whole big group of them, and Christopher was always too shy to talk much in that sort of situation, so he was taking his chances now. Glad you liked the book, he said, hands in his pockets as he went. Wasn't it a nice ending? Yeah, great, Remus puffed, rubbing his hip, trying to get it going. Maurice, the character, reminded me a bit of you. What? Nah. He was starting to sweat with exertion despite the cold February air. He wiped his forehead, squinting uphill. Sirius and James were striding ahead, laughing about something together. Christopher followed his eyeline. He pressed his lips together. 
Are you and he... He couldn't find the words, and Remus knew what that was like, so he just gave a straight answer. No need to be coy. Yeah, we are. Oh. Christopher sounded deflated, as if he'd still thought it was all a joke at his expense. What's that like, then? I don't know. Good. Great. I wish... He sounded so sad, and he never finished the sentence. After a long time and more struggling to keep up, Remus touched his shoulder gently. There's someone for everyone, Chris. Maybe. Oi, Mooney, come on! Sirius was yelling. They were almost at school now. Sirius had stopped under the stone arch gateway to wait. See you later, okay, Remus? Christopher muttered, hurrying off at a funny little jog. Remus ploughed on, finally reaching the school gate. His hip was screaming at him now, the joints burning, pain shooting up and down his leg. He nodded at Sirius by way of greeting, too out of breath to speak. He leaned against the stone with one arm, hoping Sirius wouldn't mind waiting a bit longer while he pulled himself together. Sorry, he panted finally. Hate that fucking hill. You all right? Sirius asked, giving him a funny look. Sorry, didn't mean to leave you behind. Fine. Remus replied, you know me, just a bit wonky. He straightened up, winced and rubbed his sign again. Is it your hip? Siri had had his hands on his hips now and was giving him an up and down sort of look that was rather like Madame Pomfrey after a bad full moon. Yeah, Remus shrugged. It's always been a bit funny. When you say a bit funny, do you mean that you're in pain? It's just sore, Remus said indignant. So pain then? Sirius raised an eyebrow. Remus hated that superior look. How long has it been hurting? Oh, I don't know. Remus threw his hands up, exasperated. What was the point of this? Since I was thirteen. Are you joking? Just on and off. What does Madame Pomfrey say? Oh, for God's sake, I don't whinge to her about this sort of crap. Remus was aware that his voice was getting louder. A few third years walking past turned and looked at him before running away, giggling. You're being ridiculous. Sirius folded his arms and tossed his hair. She's a nurse. She's supposed to make you feel better. What would you do if I told you I'd been in pain for five years? It's not the same. What are you on about? You're not a fucking werewolf. He stopped himself just in time. They both looked round at themselves furtively, checking no one was listening in. Remus scolded himself. It had been a very long time since he'd let anyone get the better of his temperature. Sirius leaned forward, glaring at him. You don't have to suffer, for fuck's sake, he muttered. That hurt. He didn't know why, but it struck Remus so sharply it knocked the breath out of him and his eyes pricked. He straightened up, careful to remain expressionless this time. He jutted his chin out at Sirius, meeting his glare. I'm not talking about this any more. Come on, we'll miss dinner. And began to stride ahead, biting back against the stabbing in his side. Chapter 137 Seventh Year Remus the Martyr The stalemate between Remus and Sirius lasted for the rest of the weekend. Sunday was Gryffindor versus Ravenclaw's Quidditch game, so they got away with not speaking much. They both sat together in the stands, cheering when it was appropriate and booing any time the Ravenclaw scored. And that's another ten points to Gryffindor, the commentator called out through the megaphone. An overwhelming sixty points now scored by team captain James Potter. No surprises there. Fans are starting to wonder what will become of the mighty Lions next year when they don't have their golden boy to depend on. Ooh, mind that bludger, Sims. Nicely done. Though I must say, I'd have veered left, but I suppose not everybody is chosen for their dexterity. Sometimes it's just about giving everyone a chance, regardless of ability. Who let Lockhart do the commentary? Sirius grumbled. Stupid Pratt doesn't even know anything about Quidditch. He told me he was lined up to play for Puddlemore, Peter said. 
and the only reason he never played for Ravenclaw was that his coach said he shouldn't squander his gift in school games. You're so gullible, Pete, Remus nudged him. I know more about Quidditch than that twat. Yeah, and Mooney knows about as much about Quidditch as you know about judging character, Sirius added, his voice unnecessarily sharp. Remus coloured. Fine. Sirius wanted to be passive-aggressive. Well, Padfoot, he replied coolly, if you want to do it so much, go and ask McGonagall. I think you'd be perfect for the job. You what? Sirius gaped at him. Remus raised an eyebrow. Oh yeah, you're the only person in this school who chats more shit than Lockhart does. Mary and Lily burst into giggles, covering their mouths. Sirius scowled. Up yours, he muttered. The game ended with 280 points to Gryffindor, but Sirius wasn't cheering. Quidditch matches generally took up most of the day, from an early breakfast listening to James's pep talks to the inevitable after-party in the common room. Sirius stayed up late, so nobody noticed that they didn't go to bed together. By Monday, they were on slightly more civil terms, or at least neither of them wanted any of their friends to know they'd been fighting. Remus immersed himself in his NEWT revision, if he wasn't alone in the library, he was extending his study group sessions to run an hour longer each night. It was the week of the full moon, and he was utterly exhausted, but at least it made getting to sleep easier. And he'd had to avoid Marlene, too, of course. He deliberately skipped going to Madame Pomfrey's Tuesday night healing classes, just in case the subject of werewolves reared its ugly head again. Marlene was the sort of girl who would derail an entire lesson if she thought injustice was being done somewhere. To Remus's surprise, Gildroy Lockhart, the swami Ravenclaw commentator, made a guest appearance in his Wednesday revision group. Lockhart was in the year below and hadn't crossed the Marauder's radar much so far. He was a bit camp and annoying, prone to laughing too loudly in the dining hall, but that was all Remus knew about him. He sidled up to Remus, his hair in ridiculous blonde bouffant curls. He stank of aftershave, too. Love the idea, he gushed. Helping other students to achieve. Really great. Uh, yeah, I suppose, Remus replied, shuffling his papers. Thought I'd lend a hand. Lockhart grinned toothily. I'm rather a whiz myself, you know. Charms, transfiguration, potions, you name it. Oh, uh, great, cheers. I said I'd go through anti-giant legislation with the third years today, but have a chat with Chris. He moved away quickly, leaving Christopher to deal with it. Wednesday was also the second official meeting of the prank planning group, so Remus and Chris stayed back in the charms classroom after the study group. Chris had a vaguely dazed expression as they leaned against Flitwick's desk, waiting. Sorry about that, Remus offered, lighting up a cigarette as Lockhart swarmed out. I don't know how to deal with him. No, it's fine. He's in half my classes, so I'm used to it, Chris replied, still looking a bit disturbed. What did he want? It took a while to figure out, Christopher frowned. He kept telling me how good he is at everything, but I think he wanted help with charms. Remus snorted disdainfully. The prank planning session was shorter than the week before. It turned out that no one had any decent ideas yet. The fourth-year Ravenclaws had uncovered some frankly terrifying curses which they were all eager to share, but Lily stepped in, reiterating the rule that nobody ought to get hurt. They split up again for the journey back to their common rooms, and Remus was faced with a choice between Marlene and Yaz or Sirius and Mary. In the end, he decided it was better the devil he knew and chose Sirius and Mary. She did most of the talking, which was a relief, and the only awkward moment came when the boys were all back in the dormitory. Remus went over to his own bed, pulling back the duvet. "'You're sleeping there, then?' Sirius asked out of the blue. Remus frowned, turning to look at him. He hadn't thought it was up to a debate. They were barely speaking to each other. Why on earth would they sleep together? And why on earth did Sirius want to call attention to it in front of everyone else? Yeah, he nodded, turning back. Full moon tomorrow. Thought we should all get as much asleep as possible. Yeah, fair enough, Sirius replied. Remus climbed in and drew his curtains shut without another word. Everything okay? James whispered very loudly. Sirius grunted a response, and that was that. Thursday, 23rd of February, 1978. 
Remus was more on edge than usual on the day of the full moon. He'd slept badly anyway, thinking about the McKinnons and Sirius, and wondering how he was ever going to fix any of it. At breakfast, it looked as though Marlene had had a difficult night too. Her eyes were rimmed red and her hair was messier than usual. Yaz and Mary sat on either side of her, vying to be the one who comforted her the most. I just can't stop thinking about him. Marlene shook her head, staring into a bowl of cornflakes. I've read so many books and accounts, and they all say it hurts a lot. Remus stopped eating his own breakfast and sipped his tea instead, trying to hide his distress. I've read that too, Sirius said. But I'm sure that as long as Danny asks for the help that he needs, he'll be fine. Remus tried to ignore this, seething quietly under his collar. Mum said to take him to the ministry. Marlene continued, miserable. They have cells there, apparently. We asked if there would be healers present, but no one will tell me anything. I'm sure it's the best place, Yaz squeezed her arm gently. Nobody agreed with her. Mary pursed her lips. He doesn't deserve this, Marlene burst into tears. He doesn't deserve to be locked up all alone. He's my lovely brother, not some... Some animal. The nausea of guilt threatened to overwhelm Remus, and he left as soon as he could. The rest of the day he could barely concentrate on his lessons. Perverse as it was, ever since the marauders had become animagi, he'd sort of been looking forward to full moons at Hogwarts. It had been a while since he dreaded one quite so much as this. When he arrived at Madame Pomfrey's office in the evening, he found her frowning her way through a pile of letters. He'd never seen her doing paperwork before. Oh, hello, dear, she smiled at him tiredly. Shall we get going? He nodded and waited patiently for her to put on her cloak. She saw him staring at the letters. They're from ex-pupils, mostly, she explained. Ones who were affected by the attacks. Some of them have family members facing their full moon, and what to do if I know anything helpful? Oh, I've been able to pass on a bit about aftercare, but you and I know how little real information there is, she continued as they walked out. Remus remained mute. I've had poor Miss McKinnon here every day, almost. She's a friend of yours, isn't she? Yes, Remus's voice cracked slightly. Madame Pomfrey patted his arm softly. It must be very hard for you, my dear. It's fine. You know you can always talk to me if you need to. Thanks. He could hear Sirius's voice in the back of his head, taunting him. I told you so. But Sirius was wrong. Physical pain was the very least of Remus's problems, and something he was willing to bear if he had to. It reminded him of what he owed. Despite his apprehension, the full moon was a relief. Remus didn't even cry out from the pain of transformation. He just let it consume him. As ashamed as it made him, it was good to become something else for a few hours to relinquish control. The wolf was still on good terms with Padfoot, at least, and they could play and run and hunt without any messy human problems getting in the way. But it wasn't to last. Friday, 24th of February, 1979. The routine was standard by now. Remus transformed back, the others checked he was okay, then left. Madame Pomfrey came to collect him. He spent the morning under a sleeping draught, woke up in time for lunch, then headed back down to his own bed in the afternoon. More recently, Sirius had been coming to collect him from the infirmary, if his timetable allowed for it, and actually, even when his timetable didn't allow for it, Sirius took any excuse to bunk off. Of course, given the way that Remus had been acting, he didn't expect Sirius to come that day. But Sirius was always full of surprises. "'Brought you a frog,' he said, waiting patiently as Remus finished tying his laces. He handed over a chocolate frog box, which Remus accepted. His temper had cooled quite a bit. Perhaps a good long sleep had been all he needed. Thanks. Can we be okay again? Sirius asked, sounding genuinely sorry. Can we both just admit we said some stupid stuff, but it's over now? Remus looked at him for a long time, letting him stew a little bit. Then he smiled. Yeah, go on then. They walked back to the tower quite happily though Remus was pushing himself a bit harder than normal, trying not to limp or show any trace of discomfort. Is Marlene okay? Remus asked as they neared the common room. Yeah, I think so, Sirius nodded. 
She got a letter from her mum this morning saying Danny's okay. Cried a bit, but she's less of a state now. Good, that's good. They pushed through the portrait hall and walked through the common room. I think I'll go up to bed for a bit, Remus said, making for the door. That's okay. Of course. Sirius nodded, over polite, as they headed up yet another flight of stairs. Remus was seriously struggling now, but he'd be damned if he let Sirius see it. You tired? Remus asked. Nah, Sirius said. Slept all morning. Peter, too. Oh, good. Remus finally reached his bed and sat down. Without even thinking, his hand went to rub his hip. He stopped as soon as he realised, but Sirius's eyes zeroed in on it at once. He looked Remus in the eye reproachfully. Did you speak to Madame Pomfrey? We had a lovely chat, thanks. Remus stiffened, defences back up. About all her poor ex-students who had to transform for the first time last night. It was all really cheery. Sirius tutted. But did you talk to her about your hip? No. Remus huffed, lying down. Remus, stop being so difficult. You see her every week. Just mention to her. I mean, I'll do it if you want me to. Jesus Christ, not this again. Leave me alone. Remus sat up again. No, Sirius retorted just as viciously. I don't understand why you won't tell her about it. I'm sure she could help. Oh my God, why can't you just drop it? I said I don't want to bother her with crap like this. You're making such a fuss over nothing. Remus was on his feet now, the wolf inside him wanting the higher ground, asserting dominance. And you're avoiding your problems again, Sirius raged. You always do this and it's so bloody exhausting. You think you're being so mature, don't you? Keeping everything bottled up. It's stupid. You're just making a martyr of yourself and it's like you want to be miserable. Oh, get fucked, Black, Remus shouted. Easy for you to have a go, isn't it? Why do we always have to talk about my shit life, hmm? Mr. Tell me a fucking secret. Sirius blinked, shocked, and Remus was elated. He'd had something now. He had Sirius in his jaws. He wasn't going to let go until he'd tasted blood. What about you, Sirius? How can we never talk about your fucked up family with your Death Eater brother and your insane cousin? Why don't we talk about your pain and your scars for a little while? See how that feels. Remus, for fuck's sake. No, I know. Why don't we talk about your mother? Remus went in for the kill, and it was more effective than even he had expected. Sirius changed completely. His expression froze, his posture tensed, as if he'd been punched in the gut. Remus almost wished he'd punched him, because then at least Sirius could just punch him back, and they could have a fair fight, and that would be it. But that hadn't been fair, and he couldn't take it back. Sirius gave him a look of utter hurt and shock before quickly turning to anger. Go fuck yourself, Lupin, he spat, storming out. Yeah, piss off then, Remus shouted as the door slammed. He was breathing hard and his face was very hot. He wished Sirius would come back and shout at him a bit more, so he could shout back, but he settled for chain smoking and the sex pistols. Fuck everybody. Sirius did not return, and Remus did not know where the map was, so he couldn't look for him. Eventually, the dorm room door did open again, and Lily and James came in, very close together and whispering happily. Oh, hiya, Mooney. James stopped as he caught sight of Remus brooding by the window. He looked a bit sheepish. Sorry, we thought you'd be in the hospital wing still. No, oh, she lets me go after lunch normally, Remus replied monotone. He got up. I'll get out of your way. No, no, Remus, don't. Lily said, flustered. We just came up here for the quiet. Really? Remus raised a sarcastic eyebrow, and Lily and James blushed, looking away. Where's Padfoot? James went over to sit on his bed. Dunno. What? Dunno. Don't care. Remus withdrew another cigarette from his matchbox and lit it with the end of the last one. Are you... having a fight? Look, stay out of it, Potter. Remus snarled. James recoiled and looked at Lily, who shrugged back at him. At that very moment, it was as if it had been summoned just to break the tension. An owl flew in the open window, surprising all three of them. It was from the Potters, and James retrieved two letters tied to its leg. He glanced down at one and held it out to Remus. For you, Mooney. Clicking his tongue irritably, Remus got up off the sill and went to snatch it from James's outstretched hand. 
He opened it, skimmed the brief note from Mrs. Potter, who'd been so kindly forwarding all of his correspondence. He expected another postcard from Grant, but it was a neatly folded envelope. He didn't recognise the tiny blue ink handwriting, but it had a muggle stamp. He looked down at the return address, written in tiny script on the back. If undelivered, please return to Miss Hope Jenkins, Sparrow Ward, Cardiff City Hospital, Cardiff. Chapter 138, Seventh Year, Hope Ms. Hope Jenkins Remus choked on his fag, then dropped it, burning a hole in his trousers. Yelping with pain, he leapt up, patting wildly at the hot patch on his thigh. Remus! Lily stared at him, alarmed. Are you all right? Yeah, yeah. He picked up the cigarette and tossed it out the window. He'd scrunched up the little envelope in his other hand. He stuffed the crumpled paper into his pocket. Just nipping to the loo. He hurried in the little bathroom and slammed the door shut, trying to regulate his breathing a bit. Okay, okay. He ought to have expected this. He was the one who'd written to her, after all. Remus pulled the letter out of his pocket and smoothed it out. He couldn't have opened it in front of Lily and James. It might say anything, and he was so unprepared. He bit his lip. He wanted another cigarette badly, but he'd just chucked the last one out the window. Typical. He peeled open the envelope slowly, taking care not to tear it, as if it might mean something. The paper was tissue thin, and he unfolded it gently. The handwriting was more recognisable now. He knew it from the original letter, written all those years ago, except now it was more spindly, noticeably crooked, as though the hand had been shaking. Dear Remus, I am so sorry it has taken me so long to reply to you. I am afraid I have been unwell and have not been at home to receive post. I am so happy to hear from you. I am sorry I cannot write more, my darling, but I would love to hear how you are getting on. Please write again to the address below. Love, Mum. Remus's own hands were shaking now. Love, Mum. What the fuck did that mean? He felt rage creeping up on him, ready to swallow him whole. The spat with Sirius faded into insignificance. Now he was truly furious. It was an anger that had lain dormant for a long time now, but had always been there, in the core of him. An anger that had no direction, no purpose, other than filling him up with red-hot mania. Maybe Greyback had put it there. Maybe Hope's abandonment had. Right now he didn't give a shit. Unable to control himself, he kicked the bathroom door. He kicked it so hard that he splintered the wood, cracking it right through. Fuck, he muttered. Ow. He hoped he hadn't broken a toe. Oh my god, Remus! Lily's voice sang out again. Sorry, he said, almost on instinct, as he wrenched his foot free from the door. He unlocked it. James was standing right there, his eyes big and wide, Lily just behind him, as if he was shielding her from Remus. Look, what the bloody hell are you playing at? James said, his voice hard. Look, if you've had a tiff with Padfoot, then sort it out between you. Don't start tearing our room apart. Sorry, Remus said again, feeling quite small. He'd never been told off by James before. It was scarier than he expected. Remus? Lily pushed her boyfriend aside impatiently. What's wrong? He shook his head, looking down at the letter in his hands. His shoulders slumped. He was still breathing too hard to be able to speak. He handed it to her. Lily gave him a quizzical look, but took the paper from him. As she read it, her eyes grew bigger and her mouth dropped open. James read it over her shoulder, and soon their expressions matched. Remus couldn't seem to get his breathing under control. He wasn't quite sure what was happening. His chest grew very tight, as if all the air had been sucked out of the room. He suddenly felt very hot and very dizzy, and he was seeing stars. He stumbled, clutching the doorframe for dear life. Remus? Lily's voice came to him in an echo, as if he was at the bottom of a deep well. Her soft hands were on his shoulders and she guided him down toward the floor, which was a good thing, because his legs had decided to give up. He started rubbing his back slowly and was speaking very calmly. Deep breaths, Remus, do you hear me? In through your mouth, then out through your nose, okay? With me. One, two, three... He didn't know what sort of magic that was, but it started to work, 
Then after ten deep breaths, he began to feel normal again. His vision clearing, he looked up. Lily was sitting beside him on the dusty bedroom floor. James was standing over them, looking worried. He had the letter. Thanks, Remus said, still short of breath. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. My sister has funny little turns like that all the time when she gets anxious, Lily explained. Got anything sweet? She normally has a biscuit after the worst has happened. Um, yeah. Remus delved into his pocket for the chocolate frog Sirius had given him earlier. He unwrapped it and bit the head off quickly. His mouth filled with rich sweetness, and he really did feel much better. He tried to get up, and James immediately offered a steady arm to help. Sorry I had to go, Mooney, he said, still sounding worried. I was a right dick. No, I shouldn't have broken the door, Remus replied, carefully brushing his trousers down and walking to his bed to sit. Oh, that's nothing, Lily got up and withdrew her wand. Ripero, see? Can I have the letter back? Remus asked weakly. Yeah, sorry. James hurried to pass it back. Remus read it again. His stomach tightened, but he didn't get dizzy again. Love, Mum. I didn't know you'd sent a letter, James said. I didn't know you even knew where she was. Your parents helped me, Remus said, still rereading it. I only told Sirius about it. Oh, love, Lily came to sit by him. She squeezed his hand. Are you going to write back? Remus looked up, staring ahead. He'd made a decision. No, I'm going to see her. Oh! Lily squeaked. Yes, of course. Um, I bet McGonagall would help you arrange it for the weekend, maybe. No, Remus shook his head. I'm going right now. What? James said. I've waited long enough, Remus said. I've got the address. I'm going. Remus, don't you just want to have a think? Lily started. No, Remus said, pulling his hand away from her. His hand brushed against the cigarette burn on his leg. Bugger. Where was he going to get another pair? Better try a mending spell once he'd calmed down a bit. He got up and went to his trunk to find a clean pair of trousers. Couldn't meet his mother with cigarette burns on his clothes, could he? No thinking, he said to Lily. She's in a hospital. God knows why, but I might not have long. He undressed without even thinking. Lily looked away quickly, blushing, but he didn't care. Prongs, he said. Can I have your cloak? Of course, James nodded without hesitation. Thanks, I'm going to try and apparate from Honeydukes, I think. Shouldn't be gone all night. I can be back before curfew, I bet. Good plan, James nodded. How are you going to get to Honeydukes? Lily asked, looking very confused. Remus looked at James curiously. The other boy gave a sheepish chuckle and pushed his glasses up his nose. Um, there's a sort of a secret passageway. Less than half an hour later, they'd passed the hunchbacked witch statue and were about to begin the journey to Hogsmeade. They'd hurriedly dressed in muggle clothes, something Lily had suggested almost at the very last minute. James had wanted to tell Sirius and Peter, but Remus refused. Peter couldn't apparate anyway, and Remus didn't have room for Sirius in his head right now. Luckily, James respected this reasoning. How many more secrets do you lot have? Lily was whispering, staring about her as they progressed along the dark tunnel. Does she know about the map? Remus asked innocently. What map? Potter! What map? They weren't really fighting. It was just part of the fun for Lily and James, or the bickering. They spent so many years doing it already, they just didn't know how to stop. Remus liked it. They kept his mind off everything. Because he'd calmed down now, and the rational thoughts were starting to creep in. Where are you going? Why would you think she wants to see you after all these years? You'll get caught out of bounds and expelled, and you'll drag Lily and James down with you. And Sirius. He wanted more than anything to have Sirius nearby, if only they weren't fighting. Perhaps he'd brought this all on himself, invoking Sirius's mother like that. Oh God, what if Hope was like Walperga? But he pressed on, because he'd come this far now. Soon enough they were in the cellar of Honeydukes, and all memorising the hospital address, preparing to apparate. That part was easy. Remus was so full of emotions and adrenaline that he'd barely had to turn his head and he was whooshing through space, following the current of magic toward Cardiff. Lily and James landed moments later, holding hands. This is Wales, then, 
Lily said, looking around at the quiet city street they found themselves on. Never been before. Me neither, James and Remus replied in unison. Let's look for the hospital then, she smiled. She dropped James's hand and took Remus's instead, half leading him to the end of the road. They'd overshot by only a street or two. The main building was ornate, old and red brick, the rest of it sixties grey concrete. It had that cold institutional atmosphere which reminded Remus too much of St. Edmund's. Right, Lily said brightly, facing a large map of the building, beneath a signpost pointing in various directions. It was Sparrow Ward, wasn't it? So, so that's, um, over here. She set off again, and Remus was so, so glad she was there, because everything in him was telling him to run away and never look back. Sparrow was in one of the concrete blocks. They stopped outside. Um, Lily, James, Remus said, holding them back. Do you mind not coming with me? I just, I want to do it by myself. Sorry. Of course, Lily said, patting his shoulder. We'll wait right here. Right, James? Okay, James nodded carefully. Mooney, are you sure you don't want me to get... He won't come, Remus said with absolute certainty. You were right, we did have a fight. I was awful to him. I said some really shitty stuff. He's angry and he's got a right to be. Yeah, but still, it's fine, Prongs, Remus reassured him. I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm going in now. Good luck, Lily smiled. He nodded grimly and approached the revolving doors. Inside the hospital, there were signs pointing in all sorts of directions, and three times Remus had to turn back on himself because he'd taken a wrong turn or gotten the wrong lift somewhere. It was an awful place. It stank of sickness and piss and disinfectant masking blood and death. Remus's nerve was weakening by the moment. Finally, he passed through a set of double doors with Sparrow printed neatly above in blue and white. It led to a quieter corridor with a nurse's station at the end and lots of light open rooms with neat rows of people lying in bed. Remus shuffled along to the nurse's station, trying to get a look at the names of the patients listed on the wall. Who you looking for, lovey? A plump nurse asked him with a pleasant smile. Uh, Hope Jenkins, Remus mumbled. Ah, relative, are you? Yes, I'm her son. Oh, she'll be so pleased. She talks about her kids all the time, does Hope. Just follow me, pet. He didn't have time to be stunned by this latest revelation that his mother had kids. Plural. Speechless, Remus followed the nurse down the squeaky green liner corridor onto a ward with six or eight beds in it. She led him to the far window where the light poured in. Hope, my love, you've got a visitor. Your boy's come to see you. Isn't that nice? The nurse ushered him in and he stood at the end of the bed, helplessly. The woman lying in the bed looked as though she'd been dozing, though she was propped up in a half-sitting position. She was blinking now, disoriented, and frowned slightly at the nurse. Who? She spoke in a quiet, hoarse voice, still confused, until her dark eyes landed on Remus. Her pale eyebrows shot up. Oh, she said. Hello, he waved, feeling stupid. I'll give you two some privacy, the nurse was saying now, drawing the pale hospital curtains round the bed. Can I get anyone a cup of tea? No, thank you. They both replied, still staring at each other. She was very small and very frail, skeletal even, her bones and tendons showing through the skin. She looked much older than Remus had imagined, but perhaps that was just the illness. Her face was sunken and had a morbid skull-like quality. He remembered how lovely she'd looked in a photograph, and how pretty she might still be if she was well. More alert now, her watery black eyes stared up at him with an almost greedy glint, as if she was absorbing every inch of his gangly frame. He stood still and let her. Oh, she whispered hoarsely, her eyes filled with tears. Oh, you look just like him. So this was his mother. He looked down at her and felt nothing at all. He cleared his throat. I got your letter. He didn't know what else to say. He wished he hadn't come at all. You didn't have to come, she replied softly. I didn't dare ask you to, but I did want to see you. I've wanted to see you 
for years. She closed her eyes and the tears ran tracks down her thin face. He bit his tongue. All sorts of foul, nasty things boiled in his throat wanted to be spoken. But what use was it? She was clearly dying. He could smell it on her. Angry words would make no difference. She spoke again. You're at Hogwarts? Yeah, he nodded. Final year. He'd be so pleased. Lyle, your father. Silence again. Remus didn't want to look at her for too long. She looked so sad, so very weak and sick. Is there anything you want to ask me? Remus shrugged. This was more horrible than he could have imagined. She laughed softly. You won't hurt my feelings, you know. This might be your only chance. She swallowed when he still did not speak. All right, then. I'll just tell you. I'm sorry for what I did. I'm not proud. I loved your father more than... And I loved him with my whole heart. He was everything to me. I wish you could have just known him. When you were hurt and he died, I just didn't know what to do. I was so young. I was so alone. I hadn't known my own family in years, and I didn't even know the neighbours because Lyle said we had to keep things a secret. She was well. She recognised the accent now, the way she spoke his father's name in two gentle syllables. Lyle. He felt stupid for not realising, seeing as they were in Cardiff, but still. No one had ever told him she was Welsh. He supposed it wasn't pertinent information to anyone but him. Look, he said, it's fine, you don't have to explain. I've thought about you, she said desperately, every day. My boy, my poor little boy. Don't, he said, feeling uncomfortable, frightened even. It's okay, please don't. He sat down in the stiff-backed hospital chair next to her. He didn't reach for her or hold her hand. That felt like too much. I thought it was the best thing, she wept, the tears trickling down in the pillow she lay on. I couldn't have looked after you. You were too strong. Even when you were that small, I had to lock you up. You were so frightened and you were crying for me and I couldn't go in. He felt as if a heavy block of ice had settled in the pit of his stomach. He just wanted her to stop talking. He didn't want to hear this. You did the right thing, he said. You did. You did everything you could. I never blamed you. That was true. He'd blamed his father over and over in his head, hated him fiercely for years, but he had somehow felt more sympathy for his mother, a muggle who was left just as much at sea by Lyle's death as he was. Does he still happen? She asked, her eyes big. They were the same greeny brown as his own. He nodded. It's not as bad, he lied. I have help. It's safer. She looked relieved, which made him happy. And school? I bet you're as clever as your dad. I like school, he said. I do pretty well. He wasn't sure what else to say about it. I, uh... I have his wand, Lyles. She smiled, paper white, thin, stretching over a hollow face like a skull. And do you have someone in your life looking after you? I... He thought of Lily and James and Peter and Grant and Madame Pomfrey and Mary and Marlene and even Professor McGonagall and Sirius. Yeah, I do. I have friends. He glanced at the record player on a bedside table and the little pile of records on the chair. The Beatles, Cliff Richard, the Kinks. Are these yours? He asked, genuinely curious for the first time. Oh, yes, she nodded. Love a bit of a dance, I do. Lyle was the reader, but I'm happiest with a nice pop song. He used to tease me. Her accent was lovely, a sweet, friendly up and down. He was glad she wasn't posh. He'd hoped he didn't sound too common for her. I like music too, he said softly. 
He couldn't bring himself to raise his voice, but she didn't mind. David Bowie, mostly. You must take after me, she said sleepily, still smiling. My bouncy little boy. I used to let you down on the rug while I did the housework and play me records and you'd just jump around in your bottom and wriggle like you were dancing. Love Me Do was playing on the radio when you took your first steps. She'd grown tearful saying all this. Her eyes had welled up. I think I remember, he said quickly. It was a lie, but it would make her happy. He didn't want her to be this sad, not for his sake. Without thinking, he reached out and took her hand gently, as if she might shatter. It was a very little hand. She was a very little woman. I love the Beatles, he said. Always have. She beamed. Even through the hollow cheeks and dark eyes of her illness, she had a lovely smile. Hope squeezed her son's hand and smiled up at him, and they were comfortable like that for quite some time. Remus felt the stirring of something toward her, something warm and old and familiar. Eventually he offered to put some music on for her. Oh, the play is broken, she replied. Really? Let me see. Remus fumbled in his pocket for his wand and gave the black wooden box a tap. He did it without letting go of her hand, and she made a small sound of delight and pride, seeing him use magic. The record began to turn, and the sound which came out was clear and lovely. It was a Fairport Convention record. Remus had never bothered with them much before. Too hippie for him. But she smiled as Sandy Denny's lark-song voice began to fill the room, so he listened. Across the evening sky, all the birds are leaving, but how can they know it's time for them to go? Before the winter fire, I will still be dreaming. I have no thought of time, for who knows where the time goes? Who knows where the time goes? They both sat listening quietly to the music, and Remus saw that he got some of his shyness from her, maybe. She never held eye contact for too long, and never pushed him into talking. Remus had a sense that they could sit in contented silence like that for hours, and understand each other just as well as if they'd done nothing but talk. In a little while, the nurse came back. It was already after visiting hours, she said, and Matron would be on her case. Remus didn't want to go, and Hope didn't want him to leave. Will you come back? she pleaded, turning weepy again. I will, he promised. As soon as I can, I will. She pulled his hand to her lips. She was very weak, but he let her. She kissed his scarred knuckles. I love you, my darling. Something inside him broke when he realised he couldn't say it back. He didn't know how to say it and mean it. I'll see you soon, he promised again, hoping she didn't mind too much. He left the room in a daze, and it was a miracle he managed to get out of the hospital at all. It must have taken twice as long as it took him to get in. Outside, it was growing dark. Lily was sitting on a bench with a big black dog at her side. She stood up, the streetlight behind illuminating her hair, seeming to set it alight. A halogen halo. All right, Mooney, she asked, eyes serious. He shrugged, speechless. Instantly, Lily stepped forward and wound her arms round his waist, laying her head against his chest and squeezing. He wrapped his arms round her gratefully and hugged her back, bowing his head to inhale the lovely apple skin smell of her. He was crying and Sirius was right there, but he didn't care. He just let Lily keep squeezing him, feeling as if she were holding him together. He could hear Padfoot whining and panting. Finally, he broke away, rubbing his eyes. Sorry, he said bashfully. Don't be stupid, she squeezed his arm, her own sea-green eyes shimmering. Want to go home? Actually, Remus sniffed. I want to get really, really pissed. Padfoot barked. Chapter 139 Seventh year. Drunkards. Right, pub then, Lily said, business-like once more. I think we'd better go back to Hogsmeade, don't you? I don't fancy our chances apparating back to Scotland drunk. Yeah, good plan, Remus nodded, wiping his nose on his sleeve, still sniffing. Where's James? Well, we realised it was going to look really suspicious if both the head boy and the head girl were missing, Lily laughed. So he went back to cover for us. He, um, he sent Sirius. We both thought, it's okay, Remus nodded. He finally turned to address the dog sitting patiently by. 
Serious? He transformed back at once and stood there looking awkward, rubbing one arm with the other. Hello, Mooney, he said softly. Hi, Remus nodded back, suddenly very shy. Oh, Remus, I forgot! Lily broke the atmosphere. She handed him a small, square cardboard box, a carton of silk cut. James's idea, she shrugged. Lifesaver, thanks. Remus accepted them gratefully. I'd better go get in touch with him, actually, Lily continued, glancing between the two boys. Black, give me the mirror. I'll go down and let him know where to meet us. Sirius handed her the compact, and she smiled at them both, before walking a little ways away, so that she was just out of earshot. Remus sat down on the bench, opening the box of fags with his teeth, then pulling one out. He held it up to Sirius. Light it for me? I'm so nervy it'll probably blow up in my face. Sirius clicked his fingers and the cylinder lit. Remus sucked on it appreciatively. Sirius sat next to him. Mooney, I'm... Sirius... They both tried to speak at once, then smiled at each other timidly. Serious? Remus said. I'm sorry. I was a twat. You were, Sirius nodded, taking a cigarette of his own. But you weren't completely wrong. Nor were you, Remus sighed. I don't know what's wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with you, Remus. Sirius touched his knee, gently looking him in the eye. He was in muggle clothes, which was a nice change, Remus thought. Black jeans and his black leather jacket. Remus smiled. You look really good. So what else is new? Sirius stuck out his tongue. He turned solemn again. I couldn't believe it when Prongs told me about the letter. I felt like shit for shouting at you. I just wanted to make sure you were okay. Then he said you'd gone. Sorry, Remus replied. I just had to get here straight away. I didn't even think. I wouldn't have either, Sirius admitted. Though actually, I don't know if I would exactly rush to my mother's bedside. Remus snorted half-heartedly, then they were both quiet for a bit, thinking about their mothers. What's she like? Sirius asked finally. Remus considered this carefully before answering. He tried to recall her voice, her eyes, the way her hand felt in his. She's nice, he said. I think I like her. All right, you two, ready? Lily returned, obviously having judged them suitably made up. Yeah, they replied, smiling. They ended up in the three broomsticks, all five of them. James had brought Peter down from the castle with him. Three fire whiskies in, and Remus was feeling pleasantly warm and loose, grinning dopily as his friends made a racket for his benefit. No one asked him any questions, which was perfect. They just drank and laughed and talked like real teenagers for once. This map is some of the best magic I've ever seen, Lily marvelled after studying it for some time. And you only use it for pranks? What else would we use it for? Sirius raised an eyebrow. You've even got the moving staircases, Lily exclaimed, clearly delighted. That was one of mine, Remus said eagerly. It was all yours, Sirius said. The whole thing was your idea, Mr. Mooney. Yeah, but you lot did loads of work on it. What are you going to do with it at the end of the year? The four boys looked at each other with a note of sadness. The map would no longer be useful to them if they weren't at Hogwarts. Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot and Prongs would no longer be Hogwarts's premier mischief makers. James shrugged. Pass it on, I suppose? Maybe to someone in the cooperative? Remus hated that idea and finished his fourth drink. Rose Murta, Sirius called out, raising a hand. Another round, darling. Right you are, my love, she called back. Flirt, Remus nudged him under the table. I'm trying to get you drunk, Sirius replied piously, as requested. I'm already drunk, Lily slurred, blinking hard. I don't know how I'm going to walk back to school. I'll carry you, James said valiantly, though he was clearly starting to get a bit wobbly himself. I don't want it to be over, Peter said morosely. Calm down, Wormy, we're not going back yet, Sirius said as Rom's murder appeared with a tray of drinks. Remus grabbed another fire whiskey and knocked it back. He liked the burn. It felt like it was working. 
I don't mean tonight, Peter said, clumsily slamming his chubby fist on the table. I mean school. I mean everything. School isn't everything, Lily patted him gently. No, he sighed. But it's all going to change, isn't it? We won't see each other all the time. We'll all have jobs. Speak for yourself, Sirius laughed. Some of us are independently wealthy. Anyway, of course we'll see each other every day, idiot. We're all moving in together. Lily and James looked at each other, suddenly sober. Sirius's eyes narrowed. What? Mate, James said awkwardly. Er, uh, Lily and I have been talking about maybe getting a flat together after the summer. Yeah, Sirius nodded. We'll all move in and... Padfoot, Remus touched his knee. He means just the two of them. What? Why? Let's not talk about this now, Lily said hurriedly. Nothing's decided. But everyone could see that it was. What about this prank then, James said, still eyeing Sirius. What are we going to do if no one comes up with anything good? We will. Remus said. There's time. Is it just me or is the mass levitation idea starting to sound good? Oh god, you are drunk, Sirius smirked. How the fuck are we supposed to levitate 200 students? And why would we? Be funny, Remus shrugged, then giggled. Everything seemed like it would be funny right then. There are enough of us, James said. If everyone concentrates, we could easily levitate them all. And do what with them? Practical jokes need a practical element, Sirius insisted. Everyone else burst out laughing at him. He shook his head disdainfully and took a swig of his butterbeer. You're not drinking, Remus said suddenly. Er, uh, no, Sirius looked down self-consciously. Thought someone better stay responsible enough to get you lot back in one piece. Ah, uh, Lily grinned dopily. You do care, Black. You're all soft and sensitive, really, aren't you? I don't want anyone expelled before we can get this prank off the ground. Off the ground? So you agree with the levitation idea? James cackled. Oh, for goodness sake. Sirius rolled his eyes. I'm going to the loo. He got up and left them laughing. Remus took the opportunity to pop out for a cigarette. He could have smoked in the pub and thought that Lily and James might let him get away with it, but he wanted to admit it to himself. Outside was nice and cool, the air felt clean. He lit up and started puffing away, wrapping his arms round himself against the chill. He was really drunk. He had to lean against the wall just to stay up. It was nice. He didn't have to worry about anything if he was drunk. No one would expect him to. He leaned his back against the wall, catching sight of the pale crescent moon glowing through the scudding clouds. He thought of Livia, as he often did when he saw the moon, and Castor. He thought about their warning and how it had been so meaningless in the end. Why was that? Remus's whiskey-adled mind hit on something, something he hadn't thought about before, but as soon as it was there, it was gone again. He shook his head dazedly. All right, Sirius came out and joined him. Hmm. Remus nodded, smiling widely. Pisshead. Oi! Remus shot back playfully. I can hold my drink, thank you very much, unlike some. Oh yeah? Sirius humoured him, leaning against the wall too. He took Remus's hand and laced their fingers together. Yeah! Remus nodded emphatically. Remember my fifteenth? You and Pete got so wankered you threw up in the tunnel. Godric, how could I forget? Sirius laughed. Horrific. Nah, Remus sighed happily, squeezing Sirius's fingers. It was nice. You fell asleep on my shoulder and told me I was magic. Did I? You did. That sounds nice. I must have been very drunk, Sirius laughed. Not that I don't think you're magic, Mooney. Remus's mind had drifted, though. His cigarette had gone out and he dropped it. Wish I could say stuff like that. Like what? Sirius frowned. Nice stuff. You say lots of nice stuff, Mooney. 
Remus shook his head, frowning. It was no good. Need another drink. Okay, come on then. Inside, Peter was half asleep, propped up on his elbow, and Lily was sitting in James's lap. She seemed to be trying to locate his tonsils with her tongue. Bloody hell, Sirius groaned. Give it a rest, you two. Remus sniggered, finishing the last of his whiskey. That was better. You can talk, Lily poked her pink tongue out at him. Marlene told me she caught you two snogging in the corridor the other night. So what if she did? Sirius replied primly. It was private enough until she showed up. Christopher was there, Remus put in. Lily laughed and pointed at Sirius. Ha! Exhibitionist! She's right, Remus nodded drunkenly. You are. Remember I caught you with Mary all the time when I was a prefect? Oh, well, that was Mary. You know what Mary's like. Remus! Lily said, still giggling and quite pink in the face now. You won't believe what Mary told me about you last year. What? It was before you came out, so you'd think she'd admit it was made up by now. But she told me and Marlene that you and she, you know... Made sweet heterosexual love, Sirius supplied, barely stifling his own laughter now. Oh, Remus said. Yeah, that's true, Ashley. What? Lily stared at him, her mouth open. Ages ago. Last year, actually, Sirius corrected. It's fine, Lily. He only did it to make me jealous. Arrogant prick, Remus snorted. Peter began to snore. James looked at him, then at his pocket watch. Reckon we'd better head back soon. Remus insisted on not only finishing his drink, but everyone else's before they left. He wanted to be good and drunk, so that way he'd fall straight to sleep without any of the intrusive thoughts that had been plaguing him since Marlene's return. Though he wasn't going to tell Sirius, his hip didn't hurt as much with all that liquor in his blood. James was true to his word and gave Lily a piggyback all the way to Honeydukes. Remus looked at Sirius with a quirked eyebrow. The other boy laughed. I'll levitate you if you want, but I'm not carrying you. Who says romance is dead? Peter yawned, rubbing his eyes and trailing alongside him. By the time they were descending the steps into the cellar of the sweet shop, Remus was feeling a lot less cheerful about the whole thing. Perhaps the last few whiskies had been a bad idea. His head was starting to throb painfully and his vision was swimming. His limbs felt heavy and as they sank into the darkness of the tunnel... He quite fancied just curling up to sleep right there. No one will miss us, he mumbled as Sirius gently pulled him along. So we can tomorrow. I don't really think you'll be happy waking up here, Mooney, Sirius chided gently. Trust me. I trust you, Remus replied, his mouth thick with saliva. It was all right for Peter. He transformed into a rat and curled up to sleep in Lily's pocket. He's so good at that, Sirius marvelled. I can't transform, drunk. I can, James said excitedly, and promptly did, much to Lily's fright. Jesus Christ, she breathed. I'm never going to get used to that. Prongs bowed his antlered head and lowered to one knee, allowing Lily to climb onto his back. She gripped his neck, grinning and whooped as James set off clattering down the tunnel at a gap. Remus and Sirius stared after them as they vanished into the darkness. Charming, Sirius huffed. Why are you a more useful animal? Remus grumbled, leaning heavily against him. It's not like we get to choose. Uh, Remus groaned. I'm going to be sick. Uh, over there, then. Sirius grabbed him by the shoulders and turned him round just in time. Luckily, Remus hadn't eaten much that day, but it still felt horrible. His gut contracted painfully, and he retched until his eyes bulged and he thought he'd choke. His eyes were stinging with tears when he finally came up for air. He rubbed them away quickly. Sirius handed him a goblet of cold water. Where'd you get that? Remus spluttered, wiping his mouth. Keep it on me for full moons, Sirius shrugged. Weightlessness charm. 
Must have left it in my pocket. Boy, just sip it or you'll chuck it up again. Remus obeyed. He washed his mouth out and spat. Sorry, he said weakly. That's disgusting. Call it payback for your fifteen, Sirius laughed. Come on, shall we keep going? Remus nodded a hand on Sirius's shoulder to keep himself steady. Shouldn't have got so drunk, he mumbled. You deserved it, Sirius replied blasé. After the day you've had, or the week you've had. I was a prick. Remus was getting melancholy now, feeling sorry for himself. Sirius wasn't having any of it. Enough of that now, we've talked about it. I am a prick, though. No, you're lovely, Sirius insisted. I don't have any feelings, Remus moped. What are you on about? Of course you've got feelings. Look, we're nearly there now. Uh, those bastards have gone off without us. Hey, do you reckon Prong's figured out how to change back? She told me she loves me, Remus said, his forehead on Sirius's shoulder. What? Who? Oh, right. Sirius stopped to check. He was okay. He tried to be comforting. Well, that's good, isn't it? Nice to hear that. I didn't say it back. Oh, Mooney, that's to be expected. Doesn't mean you haven't got feelings. I know you've got your heart set on being a monster, but I'm sorry to tell you that you're not. Couldn't say it, Remus insisted, his voice muffled. I don't think I could say it to anyone, even if I want to. Sirius went very quiet and very still for a while. They were at the entrance of the tunnel now, and in a few moments they'd be back inside the castle. Sirius gave Remus a quick hug, stroking his hair gently. He pulled away and held his hand tightly. That's okay, Remus, he whispered, even though they were alone. That's okay, because it's not something you say. It's something you do, right? Right, Remus nodded, cheerful and drunk, but somewhat placated. Good, Sirius smiled again. Now, let's get you to bed, eh? Hmm, Remus agreed. Just as Sirius was pushing the statue of the humpback witch aside, Remus touched his arm. Sirius? Yeah? You're magic. Chapter 140, Seventh Year, Brilliant Ideas Saturday, 25th of February, 1978 Remus didn't think he'd ever hated fire whiskey more. When he woke up the next morning, his throat was raw, his limbs ached, and his head was throbbing. He'd take on full moon over a hangover any day. At least after a full moon, everyone was sympathetic. Ugh. Someone else groaned from their bed. There were loud footsteps, as whoever it was ran to the bathroom, slammed the door, and began to throw up noisily. Lovely, Sirius murmured from the pillow next to Remus. All right in there, Pete, James shouted. He was met with an alarming gurgling sound from within the bathroom. Bit of breakfast will sort you out, James advised. Remus heard James's feet hit the floor. He began to whistle a jaunty tune. Bloody perfect potter in his immunity to hangovers. Remus's stomach growled. Breakfast sounded good, despite the stabbing pain behind his eyeballs. Sirius raised his head at the noise and grinned. All right, Mooney. Hmm, he nodded weakly. Thirsty. Hungry. Suppose I'm not getting my Saturday lie in, then, Sirius sighed overdramatically. He whipped back the duvet, then the curtains to climb out. Remus sat up slowly. Pyjamas? He grumbled, feeling around under his pillow. Yeah, you put up a bit of a fight on that front, Sirius chuckled, stretching and yawning. You said you were too hot. You threw them across the room and I gave up. Defeatist, Remus replied, clambering out of his bed in his boxers to look for them. He'd have to go and use the shared bathroom up the hall. It didn't sound like Peter was coming out any time soon. His eyes stung in the bright morning sunlight, and he bent over, feeling about on the floor for his pyjama shirt and bottoms like a confused gibbon. "'Morning, lads,' Lily said from the end of James's bed. "'Shit!' Remus jumped, surprised, and covered his crotch with the nearest Quidditch magazine, 
then dived behind his bed curtain. What the bloody hell are you doing here? I slept here, Lily said, a grin in her voice. I didn't know you two shared a bed. I didn't know you two shared a bed, Sirius replied indignantly. He threw Remus his pyjamas. There you are, Mooney. Make yourself decent. Remus was going to kill James. What did he think he was playing at, inviting girls into their bedroom? Surely there was an unwritten rule on that? Was nowhere sacred? He pulled his pyjamas on as quick as he could over his underwear, then hurried out of the room. I didn't see anything, Lily called after him, giggling. Christ. Thank goodness it was Saturday. They made slow progress to breakfast, but in the end even Peter made it down, though he was still very pale and quiet, and just sat sipping his tea. Remus, meanwhile, loaded up his plate until he couldn't see the china pattern. Weekend breakfasts were the best. Fried eggs, thick Cumberland sausages, dark fried mushrooms, bacon, golden toast, slathered in butter, baked beans, fried tomato, black pudding. He was seriously going to miss Hogwarts food. Why is Remus eating a hangover breakfast? Mary asked, pouring herself some orange juice. And where were you all yesterday afternoon? Think you've answered your own question, MacDonald? Sirius winked. You lot have all the fun, she grumbled. Not fun, Peter replied, his head in his hands. Bad. Bad time. Have yourself something to eat, Wormtail, Remus suggested, swallowing his own mouthful. You'll feel better. I think he's frightened you'll lose an arm, Sirius smirked as Remus reached for another portion of bacon. Yeah, that was the last slice of toast, Mooney, James complained. Oh, for goodness sake, the plate's refilled, don't they? Remus rolled his eyes. I always wondered how that happens, Mary mused, watching as the toast rack was magically replenished. It's not that complicated, Sirius said. Basic teleportation spell. The house elves have tables directly beneath us in the kitchens. They load that up, then transport the food up to the corresponding plates above. Sort of like a magical dumbwaiter, Remus nodded, now constructing himself a very complex sandwich. Sounds complicated to me, Mary said. I'm useless at teleportation, though. I had to retake my apparition test three times. It's easier with inanimate objects, Remus said, helping himself to catch up. And they're only sending it directly up, so the destination part doesn't take as much effort. I tried to use it to clean my room once, Sirius said. I just transported all the messy stuff into the room above mine, except I couldn't get it back after. My mother had an impenetrable lock on the attic, and I accidentally transported my bed, so that caused a bit of a row. James and Remus sniggered. Peter raised his head. Hmm, he said. What? Billy asked. You're not going to be sick again, are you? No, I'm just thinking. Merlin, Sirius teased. Better get him a pain-killing draught. Peter diligently ignored him, eyes focused on the plate of food. Could we do it on a larger scale? He asked. The teleportation thing. You mean like getting food from the kitchens to our dorm? Remus asked. I don't think so. I think only the house elves can do it. Would be great, though. No, Peter frowned, shaking his head. More like what Sirius was saying with beds and trunks and furniture. Yeah, probably, Sirius shrugged. I'm guessing that's how everything ends up on the train at the end of term. Powerful bit of magic, though. Took me half a day to do my bedroom. Mind you, I was fourteen. We've got loads of people, though, Peter said, now looking up at James, grinning. We could do it. Peter, James was starting to smile now. Have you just had your best bloody idea in seven years of pranking? Peter grinned back at him, looking happier than Remus had seen him in ages. Emergency cooperative meeting, James carried on, standing up excitedly. Spread the word. The problem with planning a prank between thirty people rather than four was pure logistics. Between Quidditch practices, clubs, NEWT and OWL revision, and room availability... Calling an emergency meeting was nearly impossible. It ended up being pushed back to Sunday, then Monday, then, much to James's exasperation, their usual Wednesday slot. There's still plenty of time, Lily soothed, and we can always start researching it now so we have the right spells ready to show the group. 
suppose, James muttered, scuffing his feet on the flagstones as they walked back to the common room. I've got some dung bombs lying about, if you fancy blowing off some steam today. Sirius threw an arm round James. Yes! I can't hear this! Lily covered her ears and ran ahead to catch up with Mary. On the fat lady's corridor, Remus paused. You lot go on, I'll just be a minute. He stopped outside Professor McGonagall's office door. Sirius glanced back and gave him a nod of understanding before carrying on with James and Peter, loudly arguing over the best place to plant the dung bombs. Remus knocked on the office door timidly. Enter! came a voice from within. He pushed the door open and poked his head round nervously before going inside. Hello, Professor, he said, approaching her desk. McGonagall was marking some essays piled up neatly in front of her, a red quill flicking smoothly across the parchment as she read. She looked up and smiled at him pleasantly. Lupin! Lovely to see you! Please, have a seat! He sat carefully, strangely reminded of the first time he'd been in her office, and how tall and frightening she'd seemed. He'd really thought he would hate her. She seemed so much like Matron. Now he was able to meet her eye and smile back as though she were a real friend. How can I help? she asked as the red quill came to rest in the inkwell beside the papers. I... I wanted to ask a favour, he said carefully. He felt inside his pockets and pulled out the letter from his mother. He put it on the desk and slid it across. Over Christmas, the Potters helped me track down my mum. I wrote to her and she wrote back. She's in a muggle hospital in Wales. I'd like to have permission to go and see her. McGonagall only glanced down at the letter briefly before looking at him again. Of course. We can make arrangements as soon as you'd like. Really? He was amazed it had been that easy. Really? she replied. Mr. Lupin, this is a school, not a prison. Students are permitted to visit family members. Oh, well, great. I thought maybe on the next Hogsmeade weekend. Certainly. She opened a notebook and jotted something down. Come and see me on the morning of and I'll write you a permission slip. Thank you. Would you like somebody to go with you? Er, uh, no. Thanks, but no. Now that he'd done it once, he realised that it was something he needed to do alone. He wasn't looking forward to breaking that to Sirius, but there was no helping it. I'm very pleased for you, Remus, McGonagall said, smiling again. You know that my door is always open if you need somebody to talk to, though I know you aren't short of friends. Thanks, he looked down bashfully. How is your revision going, Mr. Lupin? Good, thanks, Remus nodded, glad to be on an easier subject. Better than good from what I've heard, she continued, smiling. All of your professors have excellent reports on your achievements. In most classes, you're performing well above your peers, and I hear you've not only been working hard for yourself, but to help others as well. The study groups are a collaborative thing, Remus said awkwardly. Nevertheless, Professor McGonagall shook her head. I'm proud to have you in my house, Mr. Lupin. He didn't know what to say in that, so he just looked at his hands. Mr. Lupin, his head of house continued, I have a favour to ask. A favour? Remus looked up, surprised. What on earth? Um, yes. McGonagall looked a bit sheepish and leaned in slightly. As I'm sure you know, the final Quidditch match of this year will be taking place in April, just before exams. Yeah, James has the schedule posted in our room with an enchanted countdown in seconds and everything. McGonagall smiled fondly. James has been an absolute asset to the team. He's led Gryffindor on a winning streak during his time here. The team he has assembled is first rate, primed to win their sixth cup in as many years. Which brings me to my problem. Uh, you want my help with a Quidditch problem? Indeed. Now, I cannot go into too much detail, but I am sorry to say that Alexander Gordon, our beater, will be returning home for the rest of the term. I shall be telling Potter on Monday. Of course, a replacement must be found as soon as possible, which is why I wanted to speak with you first. Professor, I'm awful at Quidditch, Remus said, breaking out in a cold sweat. 
McGonagall stared at him with a frown for a moment before breaking into a highly out-of-character chuckle. She raised her hand to her mouth apologetically. Goodness, Lupin, I didn't mean to suggest, though I'm sure you're quite capable on a broom, it wasn't you I had in mind. Oh, Remus exhaled, his shoulders relaxing. Oh, good. Um, how can I help? Well, McGonagall turned serious once more. We do have a rather good beater already in Gryffindor, but as you're aware, he was struck off the team two years ago. Serious. Now, I don't wish to condone his behaviour, nor diminish the enormity of the incident which occurred in your fifth year. No. Remus swallowed, finding his mouth quite dry. He didn't like to think about that. Not ever. Like his hip, it was a pain which sometimes resurfaced, but one that he had to ignore in order to keep going. And I stand by the punishment he received, his teacher continued. But, well, he was only struck off the team. He wasn't placed under a permanent ban. Right, Remus nodded soberly. So he can play again if he wants to. Remus, I'm not going to allow it unless you agree, McGonagall said, placing a hand on the desk between them. It was you that Sirius put in danger, and if you feel... No, Remus said. I mean, yes, I mean, let, let him back on the team. Are you sure? She peered over her spectacles at him as if trying to read his expression. Absolutely, Remus forced a smile. Of course, it was two years ago. McGonagall watched him a bit longer, then smiled back, visibly relieved. He'd done the right thing, then. The thing she'd wanted. Thank you, Mr. Lupin, she nodded, leaning back again. I'll tell Potter first thing tomorrow. Great, Remus nodded, getting up from his seat. Thanks, Professor. See you Monday. Thank you for watching, and a very special thank you to our supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can head over to our Patreon or check out some of the official Bibliobabuli merch. If you're new here, consider subscribing, and until the next video, happy reading.